Hi hey class, in this video, we'll go over the monopolistic competition and the oligopoly chapter. Okay, so this is the two, the last two of the four market structures we we'll learned in this class. So previously, we learned perfect competition and then monopoly. So those are the, the extreme cases. So perfect competition in many companies who else sell the same good and then nobody have any market power. So if you look at the uh, scale um, with market power measured, so let's draw a scale. So uh, market power, market power, um, perfect competition have the least market power. Monopoly have the most market power. Now this two monopolies competition and the oligopoly, they're somewhere in between. So they have the firms in these market structures, they have some market power, but not the absolute market power. Okay, so first, let's look at monopolistic competition. So what is a monopolist competition? Um, so there are some characteristics. So first, there are a large number of companies. Now, if you look at this term, this, this term here, monopolistic competition, is sort of a combination between monopoly and a perfect competition. A perfect competition. So it has the characteristic, characteristics of both of the market structures. So first, um, like a perfect competitions, there are a large number of companies in this market. Um, but the difference is that for, for perfect competition, everybody sells the same good. Um, but for monopolistic competition, companies sell differentiated good. So their good are different. Not the same, but similar. So differentiated. Okay, so because of that, companies have some control over the prices. So not like the monopoly. The monopolies, they're the only company in town that nobody can compete against them. So those company monopoly market structures, they have the, the, the absolute power over prices. But from monopolistic competition, that they sell something similar, but not the same. So company have some control over the prices before the, the consumer freak out and buy something else. Um, so for this, also like the perfect competitions, they are easy entry and easy exit. So companies are free to join the market, they are free to leave the market. Um, a couple of examples you can, you can you can think about this like a monopolist competition. Uh, think about the t-shirt market. Um, the shirt you guys buy. Now, there are different brands of t-shirt out there, right? You can buy t-shirt from, let's say, Abercrombie, uh, t-shirt from uh, Gap, t-shirt from G Crew, even t-shirt from Walmart. Uh, but if you look at the t-shirt you buy from those stores, um, they all look pretty similar, right? So because they're they're pretty pretty much the same design, um, pretty much they have similar colors, and then pretty much the material is about the, relatively the same. Um, but the price is very different. So some price charge you very high, some brand charge you very high price, and some brand charge you very low price. And the reason why is that because the different design, different branding on it, and then they're they're called a differentiated product. So they're similar but not exactly the same. Now, for one example, you can think about um, think about Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, so you guys probably some of you guys buy their shirt. Um, now those shirts are not cheap. Uh, if you buy a shirt from Abercrombie, it costs you thirty forty dollars. You buy a shirt from Walmart, it costs you ten five dollars, right? So this similar shirt, um, but why is the Abercrombie shirt so more so much more expensive? Well, because you buying the brand, uh, not just the shirt. So if you if you go to any Abercrombie, um, what's the store looks like? Like very dark, they always play like very loud music, right? And then inside every single Abercrombie, um, well, no, that's Hollister, right? Which one has the screen in it? So this Hollister has a screen in it, right? So it has, has a TV screen, and it's always showing some kind of beach in California. So why is that? Because the company wants you to believe that not only are you buying their shirt, they also become part of their company culture. Right, so that's why you're paying more for just the shirt. But if you buy a shirt from Walmart, you're buying just a shirt from Walmart. So that's why differentiated product. So you're not buying the same thing, and that's why some consumers will need to pay a higher price for it. All right. So uh, let's look at some of the, the demand um, between the monopolist competition and a perfect and then your um, your monopoly. Uh, so for monopoly, uh, you have a steeper demand curve. So for monopoly um, consumers in the monopoly market, um, very, we're very inelastic, that we don't have any choices. So you have a very steep demand curve. But for, uh, for monopoly's competition, that there is a competition component involved, that there are other companies competing against this monopolist, monopolistic competition company, so demand curve is somewhat flat. And if you remember from the um, previous chapters, 
the demand curve for your uh, perfect competition is actually very flat, right? There's a perfect competition. Um, so uh, again, this depends on the degree of the competitiveness in the marketplace. So monopoly is not competitive, very steep demand curve. Uh, monopoly competition is somewhat competitive, so somewhat flat. And then your perfect competition is very competitive, so very flat. Okay. And then one thing that this um, this somewhat flat demand curve shows you, it shows that the, the companies are very uh, sensitive to price changes. Because for for monopoly company, that if your price changed uh, a little bit, um, you don't see much changes in quantity. So let's suppose the price changes from um, let's say from P one to P two. Now from monopoly, so this blue line is a monopoly. You only change from Q one to Q M. So it's a very small change. But from monopoly's competition, you change it from Q one to Q C M. So a bigger change. So for monopoly's competitions, because it's so competitive, then companies are very price sensitive. Then when the price changes, companies change behavior by a lot because the consumer changes. Uh, one way to think about it, this is all, all depends on this word here, competition. So when the price of the good change, consumers will change behavior when there are more number of companies to choose from. For monopolies, there's only one company, for monopolies competitions, there are many companies to choose from. That's why companies are more price sensitive. When the price changes, consumer change behavior. Okay, so this again goes back to this term differentiated product. The companies sell similar, not the same good, so somewhat differentiated. Uh, so there is a degree of closed substitute you're gonna think about. That for, for monopoly, that there is no closed substitute. But for um, for perfect competitions, that there are some closed substitutes available. The companies, uh, the consumers can choose where the, where they buy from. Now, if you look at the uh, equilibrium for the marketplace from for from monopoly competitions, um, like any other company, the goal for the monopoly competition company is to maximize profit. And to maximize profit, you must set your marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. You know, what, guys, for tonight, I want you to dream about me. Okay, so in your dream, I will tell you to maximize profit, company will set marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. Okay, so again, tonight in your dream, I will tell you in your dream that marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. This is true for every company. Now, let's look at this marketplace first. So again, what do we do? Marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, right? So uh, marginal cost is over here, marginal revenue is right here. So that's the first point we're looking for. Now, once you have that point, go down, get your quantity, um, and then that's your first step. So find the quantity. Second step from quantity, uh, from the same quantity, go to your demand curve. That is the price. And last step from quantity, go to your average total cost curve. That is your average total cost. So again, profit equals to price minus average total cost times quantity. So this rectangle here, that is our profit. Now profit is good, but remember for, for monopolist competitions, there is free entry, E-N-T-R-Y, free entry and free exit. So for this free entry, free exit, um, if other companies sees that this one company is making a profit, now what would other company do? They would join the market and compete because there's a free entry involved. So there's no like a licensing or no regulations against company to join the market, right? So if you have one, com one company will make a profit, other company will enter the market, so free entry. Now when, you, when they're entering the market, that would drive down the demand curve for the company who is already in here. So demand goes down, price goes down, and then eventually the profit goes away. So this profit is only available in the short run. So before the market adjusts, the companies can make a profit in the short run. But in the long run, company will all behave like this. So where the um, where the price, so so price is equal to the average total cost and then companies are just barely breaking even. So they don't make any profit and they're losing any money. Okay, so um, so this is the long run equilibrium for companies in monopolies competition where there is no profit involved or no above normal profit. 
Now, last same thing. So in the short run, everything's possible. So in the short run, you can have your profit. You can lose money. You can make, make you can break even. So this last money here, you see where the average total cost is more than the demand curve. It's more than the price. So average total cost is more than price. Then company is losing money. Now again, this is the short run equilibrium. Then eventually, some company will leave the market. When company leaves the market. Demand for this company goes higher, demand goes higher, price goes higher, and then this loss will go away. Okay, so in the short run, losses of loss is possible, but in the long run, everybody's all breaking even. So just like this. Okay, so price is the average total cost, and there's no profit involved. Now this um, this graph over here is draw somewhat inaccurate. Um, if you um, if you look at the, the, your textbook, your textbook have a more accurate graph. So um, to show this long run equilibrium for companies in monopolies competition, um, that your average total cost curve should be just tangent, should be just tangent to your demand curve. So they're not they're not crossing each other like this one. You see how they're crossing over here? It shouldn't be like that. So the 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 um, the true long run equilibrium, um, the average total cost curve should be just tangent. To our demand curve okay that's where they're the they're producing um the price equal to average total cost all right okay so um your your companies in monopolies competition are are also inefficient uh, so now the most efficient one will be the perfect competition uh, where a company producing where the price equal to marginal cost uh, that's the most that's most efficient production uh, you have this allocated efficiency and also at a perfect competition companies are all they are all producing at a minimum average total cost that is also this um, productive efficiency okay um, but for monopolist competition uh, they don't have neither, neither so first of all um, because there's a profit involved that when they have a profit involved then the marginal cost tend to be uh, what price tend to be more than marginal cost now when that happens you're gonna have a dead weight loss um, that's inefficient in the market okay and also um, also for uh, for companies if you look at the graph carefully um, this intersection between your um, your marginal cost curve and an average total cost curve that's representing the lowest point of your average total cost so to achieve productive efficiency companies should produce at this point um, but for companies in monopolies in monopolies competition uh, their production point is always less um, than this minimum average total cost production point so that's also not productive efficiency okay so both if both efficiency tests they fail so your your monopolies competitions are creating that we lost because of the profit so therefore it's not allocated efficiency and then because they are producing less than the uh, the minimum average total cost amount. So there, that's also uh, not productive efficiency. The only market structure that can achieve this um, both efficiencies is your perfect competitions. Okay, so everybody else, um, because it's, they have some market power, uh, they fail to achieve both um, efficiencies. All right, so that's your monopolist competition. Uh, now next, let's look at our oligopoly. So oligopoly again is somewhere in between your perfect competitions and a monopoly. So first, um, there are very few companies. Now in, in monopolist competitions, there are many companies. Um, but in oligopoly, uh, there are very few companies. And then for the stuff they produce, they're either the same, so standardized, so like the perfect competition, or they're somewhere differentiated, like your monopolist competition. So it doesn't matter. Um, and then there's but however like a monopoly there's entry barrier that means uh, other companies cannot join the marketplace so uh, for monopoly uh, company have patents company have ownership of a key resource they can prevent other company from drawing the marketplace uh, for oligopoly very similar so for oligopoly to stay as oligopoly they must have some way to limit how many competitions are there so there is some type of barrier from into the market. And then because everybody um, either producing the same or standardized uh, or differentiated good, uh, they're all price makers. So each company have us have a ability somewhat to name their own price. Uh, however, 
this is the key for oligopoly companies, something called a mutual independent interdependence. Uh, that means companies are interconnected. Then the action of one company can have a profound impact on other companies. That's your mutually interdependence. Okay. Um, so to measure how competitive this market is, uh, we have something called a, a, a concentration ratio. Now for the concentration ratio, um, all you gotta do is to add up the top uh, four or top eight companies, their sales rep, the sales revenue as a percentage of total market. That's your concentration ratio. So basically add up the top four, top eight companies to see how much the market they have. Uh, that will be your concentration ratio. Now, uh, make sure you read the question carefully uh, because sometimes, uh, more than likely, the, the question will tell you it is asking for the four companies or the eight companies, okay? Um, so let's look at this, this example here. Um, we have eight companies here and it's asking for a four firm concentration ratio. So we're gonna pick the top four companies and then compare their total sale as a percentage of the entire market. So let's look at the, um, so obviously 60 is the most. Um, the second most would be 40, and then 28, and then 26. So that's my top four companies. So if you add them all together, uh, so 60 plus 28 plus 26 plus 40, uh, how much is that? That will be 154. So 154 is the top four company total revenue. Um, and then divided by the entire market, which is 200. So 154 divided by 200, then the percentage is 77%. That means these four companies control over 77% of the market. Now for the concentration ratio, the higher the ratio, um, the less competitive this market is. The lower the ratio, um, the more competitive the market is. Um, and now there, there are some examples that where a company have a where, where the market has a very high concentration ratio. Uh, think about the uh, the credit card companies. Now, for credit card companies, there are only four type of credit card out there, right? So your your Visa, your Master, Discover, and American Express. Now, those four companies control almost a hundred percent of the entire market, right? So that's a very high concentration ratio, which means the market is very less is less competitive. Uh, also, think about the game console market. So for video games, now which company make that? Uh, you have the Nintendo, you have um, your, your Sony's, and then you have your Microsoft. So only three companies, again, control 100% of the market, right? So that's also less competitive. So that's how you find a concentration ratio. Um, next, we'll learn something called a cartel. Now, this is not your cartel you, you see in front of the movies, okay? So this cartel uh, is any time when companies join together and then act uh, in unison as one company that's called cartel. So basically it's like a, uh, like a, like a partnership between companies um, to, to, to control the market, that's a, that's a cartel. So, big, uh, so companies acting as, a, as an entire market. Now the benefit of, for, of, that, of the company acting together is that if the, if the company uh, agreed to a production point or if company agreed to a price level, um, then those companies are basically acting as a monopoly. Now, what's the benefit of companies acting as a monopoly? Well, they can control the entire market. They can ask for whatever price they want because consumers have no choice to go from. And then because of that, the profit is maximized. So under monopoly, the company has the most profit. So what the companies can do, um, if you have like three, four companies in an oligopoly market, they can all come to agreement and then they can act as a monopoly and then charge the same price for all the consumers. And then at the end, they would divide the market into four different shares. So A, B, C, D. So the profit, the market divided by four, four different places. So that's called cocktail. Okay, so cartel is very beneficial for companies, um, but for cartel, the companies have an incentive to cheat because if you cheat, then you can be better off. Okay, so um, because of that cheating incentive, <laughs> well, this is probably the only time you can learn that cheating is good. Okay, so because of cheating incentive, uh, there is a study in economics called game theory. 
Now, if you, anybody here want to become an economics major, uh, you will learn this in the upper level economic class. So game theory is the study of um, strategic, strategic behaviors of decision makers. So between different players, um, how one player's strategy can impact other players. Um, this study is called game theory. And therefore, the, the, the most um, basic game theory game um, is called a payoff matrix. So the table shows the potential outcome uh, arising from choices made by decision makers. Um, and I also know what's a dominant strategy. So dominant strategy is a strategy in which a particular uh, a situation in which a particular strategy uh, always yield the highest payoff regardless of the other player strategy. That means it doesn't matter what the other party does, um, this one strategy is always good. Okay, so let me show you an example of a payoff matrix. Uh, so in this in this little um, table here, this is our pay, payoff matrix. Um, so it shows you the profit for each company under each scenarios. So between both companies, they each have a choice. Uh, do they go for a high price or low price? Or high price or low price? So if both company goes for high prices, then both will get a profit of 40. Uh, if both company goes for um, both goes for low prices, then both get a ten. And then uh, if uh, company A goes for high prices um, and a company B goes for low prices, that's a five for company A and a fifty for company B. But if company B goes for high prices and then company A goes for low prices, then company A will get fifty and then company B will get five. So if you just look at this table here. Um, it looks like the best outcome possible will be um, this um, both company choosing high prices because that looks like the, the most profit for everybody. Now, let me show you how this will cheat. Okay, so let's suppose um, company A and company B uh, does decide to form a cartel. Okay, so for this cartel, the both company decided uh, we both produce only for, uh, we both charge higher prices. Uh, and then our profit will be both at 40 each. So we have a cartel over here. Now, once the cartel is formed, um, let's suppose company A decide to cheat. So company A says, you know, for sure we know company B will go for high prices. What should company A does? Now, if company A also goes for high prices, so we know for sure, again, we know for sure company B goes for high prices, then if company A goes for high prices, they'll get 40. But if company B goes for low prices, they'll get 50, right? So see what's better here? Then if company A for sure, then B would choose for high prices, then company B should choose 50 instead. Because low prices is better than high prices, right? But let's suppose it's the other way around. Let's suppose if company A knows for sure that company B would choose low prices, what should company A do? Well, if company A still charge for high prices, they'll get five, five is too low. But if company B choose for low prices, they'll get 10 and 10 is better, right? So 10 is better than five. So which means doesn't matter what company B choose to do. Company B choose high prices, company A choose low prices. Company B choose low prices, company B still should choose low prices. So this strategy here, this low price, um, is the best strategy for company A, regardless what company B does. Now for company B, they have a similar situation. So if you guys look at the payout over here, so it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what company A chooses. If company A, um, let me use a different color. So what's the best color? Give me blue. Yeah, that's, uh, that's okay. Not the best, but it's doable. All right, so um, if company A choose high prices, what should company B does, right? So company B choose high prices, it's a 40, but company B choose low prices, that's a 50, right? So 50 is better than 40. So company B would choose 50 or low prices when company A choose high prices. Now, what if company A choose low prices? Now, what should company A, what should company B choose? Now, company B choose high prices, that's a five. Company B choose low prices, that's a 10. So 10 is better than five. That means this is also better than high prices. So you see what's going on over here? 
that for both companies, doesn't matter what the other company does. It looks like that this this low prices、uh, is the best strategy for everybody. So we、we'll、have a name for this. So this payout, wait, what? That's just bad color. <laughs> um. Oh man, I'm running out of colors. Um, this one over here. All right, so, so it looks like this payout here is the best outcome for everybody. It's it's the worst outcome for everybody, but that's eventually was was a company will do. Because for this low prices, there's a name for that. This low prices is called、um, dominant strategy. That doesn't matter what the other party does. Low prices is always good, right? That's called a dominant strategy. So if both company have dominant strategy, they will always choose to have dominant strategy, and they will end up over here. So both company charge for her low prices, and they will end up at ten dollar each. I can't even see this anymore. Okay, so this this outcome is called Nash equilibrium. So the outcome in which unless players can collude. Either player has an incentive to change his or her strategy, so both company decide to change do their do their own strategy, do their own dominant strategy, and then this payout is called a Nash equilibrium. Now, guys, on your test、um, and also on the quizzes, you be asked to find out what's the not what's the Nash equilibrium. So first, find out what's the dominant strategy, and then find out what's the、uh, what's the intersection between two dominant strategies, and that's your Nash equilibrium. And also, just give you a hint.、Uh, more than likely,、uh, the Nash equilibrium will be the worst outcome in the entire payout. Okay, so ten、um, and ten is the worst outcome in the entire payout. And also because you have two dominant strategies, both facing the same direction. All right.、Um, now for for the economic efficiency for all the companies,、um, it's not. Very efficient as well because you have this profit involved. You have you're gonna have a huge debt weight loss. This is the same debt weight loss as a monopoly. Running out of rooms, so the same debt weight loss as a monopoly. So、um, we must find out some way to stop this from happening. So that's why I have something called an antitrust laws. So for antitrust law. Um, you guys probably probably learned this in your in your U.S. history class. So antitrust laws, the purpose is to prevent companies、uh, from unfairly restricting competition in the marketplace. So basically, we open up the market for everybody to compete. But if company have too much advantage, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna slap the antitrust law on them.、Uh, the last time this happened、uh, was probably nineteen seventy two. When AT and T was forced to break up into two different companies, so become AT and T and then Southwestern Bell. So if you guys,、uh, anybody have those old phone book at home, those yellow pages,、uh, look at the name on it.、Uh, if it's a very old one, they will call it Southwestern Bell because that's when、uh, AT and T was forced to split them out. So that's when the antitrust happened. Okay, so no some major major law.、Uh, so the Sherman Act. Uh, the Clayton Act and also the Federal Trade Commission Act,、uh, these are all all part, a major part of our antitrust law. So basically, try to、um, reduce、um, reduce cartel, reduce collusions, and also try to encourage more competitions. Okay, so the Sherman Act、uh, made it、uh, illegal contract organizations or actions that、uh, restrict trade. Um, and then Clayton Act made illegal mergers and acquisition that lesser competition.、Uh, so a couple years ago, when AT and T tried to merge,、uh, tried to merge with T Mobile.、Um, so AT and T is our number one cell phone provider in the in the country. T Mobile is number four cell phone provider in the country. But if you allow number one to merge with number four, they will become a super number one, right? So we we that's when our at at、uh, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission,、uh, slapped this Clayton Act on them. So tell them, hey, you know what? You cannot merge. That's that's illegal because you are creating a super number one, and that's making the making the market less competitive. So and lastly, the Federal Trade Commission Act. So establish our Federal Trade Commission. So their job is to oversee the market,、uh, especially on antitrust situations, and all out unfair method of competitions, and also all out unfair or dis、uh, deceptive act or practice. Okay. So、uh, guys, that's it for this chapter.、Um, any question, let me know. All right. Good luck. Bye bye.